Hi everyone, I'm DeFi Dad. You're watching episode 37 of Yield TV. Okay, hey everyone, it's uh, Monday, November 23rd, 2020. And today we get to talk with one of, um, I think one of the most interesting DeFi analysts in our space, uh, Lisa Tan. So. Lisa uh, is the founder of Economics Design. It's a research and design firm for tokenomics. Uh, it includes a YouTube channel, a podcast that she hosts, uh, with all sorts of hard-hitting topics in DeFi that I've continually discovered are some of the same topics that keep me occupied. Um, so just always fascinated by all the content she's producing. She has a newsletter through Substack, and she also offers an online course uh, where she helps to teach folks about DeFi and crypto and tokenomics. So Lisa's publishing an upcoming book on um, all of the work she's done in tokenomics, uh, more generally to just thinking about what are the economics uh, that apply to all of the most successful DeFi projects in our space. Uh, it's called Economics and Math of Token Design and DeFi, uh, which we're going to talk all about today. So on that note, uh, Lisa, welcome to Yield TV. How are you doing? Hi, thanks for having me. I'm very, very good. Did I get all of that right? By the way, anything there that, to, to correct? I, I, I think I got it all. I just There's so much that you work on, and I, I just want to make sure people know all the cool stuff you work on. Yeah, actually, the, book con the book's title is Economics and Math of DeFi Engineering, oh, no, Token Engineering and DeFi. That's it's it. Quite a there we go. Cool. And we'll we'll be screen sharing the table of contents yeah. today and kind of walking people through like what they can expect. Uh, which, uh, by the way, like this is a book that uh, she's been working on for years. So I'm excited to share this. Um, I think, uh, you know, the timing of it is just perfect with like where we are in this market. But, you know, it's it's been a long time in coming, obviously. Uh, so Lisa, would you mind just telling everyone about your background first, maybe how you got into crypto and, um, you know, why you've tended to focus more on tokenomics? So the reason why I focus on economics is because I'm an economist. I came from an economics background and I chose to specialize in economics in my life in general because I really love economics. I live my life with economics principles and that's how I see the world and that's how the world makes sense to me. So I've always been in economics and before I came into crypto, I was in the tech space. So helping a lot of companies to expand to right. different countries or living abroad in different places. And I was living in Vietnam then before I came to know more about this whole ICO thing. So I heard about crypto with the whole, all the Silk Road thing as everyone does. It's like, okay, this is interesting, but no, I don't see where the value at is. And then came, came 2017 when I was in Vietnam and a lot of people kept telling me, look at crypto, look at crypto, look at Bitcoin, look at all these kinds of things, it's very cool. And initially I was like, okay, cool tech, it's basically startups on a new tech stack. So there's not much value add, there's not much difference. I don't see the appeal of that. And then slowly as months go by, people keep sending me white papers saying that, hey, look at this, this is really cool because there are a lot of economics in there. They talk about all these economic equations. You should take a look at that. It's like, okay, that, that's, that must be something. So I went to see, and then the first thing I saw was that, you know, you know you've know, you got bells in your head and they're all the warning signs. And they went ding, 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 ding. So a lot of scams, a lot of bullshit, a lot of, a lot of false information. So these formulas are right, these formulas are or things that you find in the economics textbook, but the way they're being applied is not used right. And I think authenticity or honesty is very important, especially in startups, because startups tend to overinflate their value add, tend to overinflate the things that they could provide without concrete steps to get there. So that's what I see in crypto, which is completely fine. But when you start using economics to scat scamming people, then I am offended. So I came into the space and I thought, okay, this needs a shakeup because there's something wrong with this. So I went in to look at, initially it was just all the layer one solutions, right? Mm -hmm. You have Bitcoin, you have Ethereum, you have all the other layer one solutions. And I looked at it and I saw, wow, this is amazing. This is the kind of future that I was imagining. Decentralization, giving power to the people, and then trying to shape up the kind of inefficient world that we have today. So this is absolutely amazing. That's, let's look deeper into that. And then during that time, 2017, 2018, the only thing people talk about is just game theory. It's like, okay, I understand that game theory is very important. Yeah. And it's right. And then everything is it was a buzzword. Yeah. 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 Yes. I'm sorry. Going. Yeah. 
no, it's okay. So everything was about game theory. And yes, I understand game theory is important. But game theory is the analysis after something happens. What we're doing in DeFi, and that's all in crypto. The, the thing that got me so excited is that we get to define and create the econo economics that is being used in this ecosystem. So if game theory is the analysis of what happens, token economics or this economics design stuff is to design how people will work, how people will move, how people will behave in this little ecosystem so that we don't need game theory to get the outcome that we want. We design the rules and mechanisms to get the outcome that we want. Like, pfft, that, was, that was the most exciting thing that, that I realized. And, so, and then I moved to London because then in Asia, everyone's very speculative in nature. And I'm from Singapore, so that's also very speculative. Vietnam was also very speculative. And then in London, that's where you have a lot more developers. You have people who, who are more interested in building the things than speculating on it. So when they spoke to a lot of different people, a lot of engineers, developers, they were very excited about it. But the thing is, the more you speak to these engineers and developers, they're like, OK, I can, I can code that, but you have to tell me what to code. You can't just tell me game theory and, and I, I can code that. So that's where I realized there's a difference between economists and engineers, and they're both very important. Engineers right. are the, 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 you know, getting, getting things done on paper, and, and economists are the planning and design of stuff. So if I have something that I want to optimize, economists tell you what, what to optimize, and developers tell you how to optimize that in code. So they have to work hand in hand. And so then I spent about two years deconstructing economics because no one wanted to listen to what I was talking about. I was like, there's so many cool things in economics, these concepts and principles. Right now, they're being used in centralized and physical ledgers and physical world. What we could do is take these concepts and apply them in distributed, decentralized worlds. Distributing governance, uh, get, allowing people to have ownership of things. It's a completely new dynamic of the old principles that we have. But nobody wants to listen to me. So I said, OK, never mind. Too early for that. So let me spend two years just to do research and then build a framework of the different pillars to consider and different variables to consider when you're designing these kind of systems. And that's, that's also how the book got started, because the book took about three years to, to research on and just figuring out what are the underlying core principles in economics that can be applied but used differently in this kind of new dis distributed world that we are trying to build. And that is just amazing. Lisa, do you recall during the bear market especially, uh, did you ever have doubts that, I don't know, maybe you, you were, um, some of your hypotheses were wrong about the importance of tokenomics? Because I, I can attest to the fact that it seemed like after we got past like the real bubble bursting, mm -hmm. I just remember there an emphasis on we need more builders. And there was always the idea of we need more developers, we need more developers. But at the end of the day, I think when you look at the most successful DeFi projects, those founders are both economists and builders. Uh, they're, they're kind of a, you know, they're a hybrid of, of all of these traits that you called out. And I feel like it's really been the last year where people have come to understand, oh, wow, like the design behind the tokenomics in these DeFi protocols this is what makes them successful or not successful. So anyways, did you ever notice like where the tide started turning? Like, has it been like the last year or, or um, anything else you noticed along the way? Yeah, so in the beginning of last year, so Q1 of last year, there were a lot of things that are being explored and being created and just having ideas to just test out different ideas. So AMM started with Bancor and there was initially, you know, there was something very new and very, very, yeah. It's something a lot of people didn't understand, but it was very interesting in its own right. And they, it was, they didn't call it bonding curve then. They just called it some, some very interesting model to be used to exchange things. And that was very, already very interesting. And then on the other hand, you have um, Simon, Simon de la Roy. I don't know. I don't really know how, how to pronounce it. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's how I screw up his name too. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it. Simon it's a French word. Roof, yeah. He yeah. worked at Consensus for quite some time, and I, I yes. think he's independent now. Yeah. Yeah. So he's doing like he's doing a lot of independent consulting right now, and then he was also exploring bonding curves. And there was this small little community that that does a lot of things related to token engineering. So stuff like block science, stuff like token token engineering. These and they are also building like CatCat. These are very focused on engineering. So the 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 delivery of all these different ideas, and they're already doing quite a cool. They're exploring all these different stuff, and it's very, very interesting. And 
and then these it's almost like these two different it's the same concept bonding curves but used in two very different ways so amms are bonding curves in a different kind of math and then the rest what simon was developing is a little bit more like fundraising so there were about six six projects that were testing out fundraising with bonding curves and then and then um yeah uniswap was also one of them and bank hall were the two you know big ones using a amms bonding curves as their mechanisms so these two are constantly being developed and being built upon. And actually during the bear market, it was, it was quite sad during the bear market because number one, nobody wants to listen to you. Um, the book I've been trying to publish since last year, but nobody wants to publish because they say that crypto is a hype, uh, crypto is all nonsense, DeFi doesn't, wouldn't last for a long time, so nobody wanted to publish the book. And then projects also started to think, okay, now I want to raise funds. And if I want to raise funds, I just need a token. I don't care what the token does. I just need tokens to raise funds. And then the whole idea was the whole idea of building something from a core fundamental perspective, a, a robust and sustainable internal economy that is that uses a token to capitalize the value add that's created in the ecosystem. And then you yeah. find a monetary value out of that. That's how you raise funds with, with tokens, not having a random piece of token and then start raising funds. But people didn't understand it then. And all the kind of cool stuff that was being built, the small little community, I think then was just a very, very small, maybe 50 to 100 people who right. really understood what bonding curves are. And it's just a very small amount of people. And then there are also a lot of other things being explored. So they were just quietly building, 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 building. And then the, the bear market makes it even quieter. That, but there, all these things are being done at the back end. And then DeFi or COVID happened. Everyone was at home. There's no conferences, so people could actually get work done. And then I, I love it. Yeah, I think it was a good thing. I felt like for some time, definitely 2018, I couldn't believe all the conferences. And meanwhile, I was newer to the space and I'm like watching the prices fall. And I, I started actually working uh, at Consensus midway through oh. the year. And yeah, I just was like amazed at how many conferences were happening when it's like, like, do we really need to be talking this much to each other about stuff? Like, there's so much to be building. So it's been really cool to see that all sort of flipped on its head. And I'm kind of hoping uh, when we go back to, uh, I think, a year from now, hopefully there will be a vaccine that's more widely spread and whatever. Let, let's say whenever we do get back to live events, I hope that they are less often. Like, I, I hope that we can continue to focus like this. Um, Curious, uh, like I, I wanted to start more general asking you about like how you explain DeFi to some of your economist friends, but just before we do, like while we're on some talk of bonding curves, um, any like takeaway lessons so far from like, there's Hedgic we were talking about earlier before we got started on, on the uh, the show. Uh, Nexus has a notable bonding curve, like anything to call out that you think is working really well or not working well with some of these more um, well-known bonding curves? I think in general, bonding curves are not something that's static, right? Bonding curves are basically math or algebra. They're just a mechanism, a tool. And the different ways to use bonding curves really shows the value add that bonding curves could bring. And yeah. there is no fixed model for it. So I think there, there are a couple of cool ways it's being used. So fundraising, fundraising, as you can imagine, with Nexus model is very interesting. And I think if all, all, the, all the content online talking about bonding curves, they're usually very focused on 2D, two-dimensional curves. So just two variables affecting each other. And then it's good because it's very easy for people to understand. The, the, uh, the flip side is that it constrains the kind of variables you could add into your system because what we're trying to build in all these different ecosystems is that it continuously gets more and more complex. And that means that the algos or the smart contract or these different bonding curves they basically are part of the algos of the smart contract. They have to be, they will evolve together with how complicated the ecosystem is going to be. So if your, ecos if your bonding curve is just going to be two variables affecting the prices or affecting your stuff in your ecosystem, it really limits the amount of how expendable it can be. And the thing about, people like to think of economics as a very static thing, as in, I built this economics for the token and that's it. But the reality is that the token really represents the economic value that's created by this ecosystem. And this ecosystem continuously evolves. Your community evolves, the type of people evolves, the type of people holding the tokens evolve, the users evolve. And because of that, 
the, the economics also has to evolve. And if you, the, token, the token model is only going to be two-dimensional, where it has two variables affecting it, then it's quite limiting in how much it could really capture the value that the, the ecosystem can bring, hence the price of the token. Yeah, that, that's well said. I, yeah, the, the bonding curve, I, I think like there's a, a few examples that we are calling out there, but the, the bonding curve to me is, is interesting because I feel like it takes um, some of the unpredictability of some of these token systems out of the equation because mm -hmm. like a, a clear example of that is Hedgick did an initial bonding curve offering this year. Yes. I thought that was one of the most smoothly run uh, um, token offerings because it was, for anyone who's not familiar with this, you, you basically go in, you have like, in this case, you had three days, you could put in as much ether as you wanted uh, to buy this token. But what happens is it waits until the 72 hours is up and it says, okay, so according to how much ether there was and how many tokens we're issuing, here is the average price and everyone gets the token at the same price. So suddenly it was easy for everyone to participate and there, like you just didn't see the frantic panic that you see with um, with other initial token offerings. So I kind of attributed that to the fact that I was like, bonding curves really are a powerful mechanism that seem to play out well in a lot of different DeFi projects. And I think we're going to see more of them. Um, Lisa, can we zoom out a sec and talk about how do you explain DeFi to your economist friends? And then also curious, how do you explain it uh, to like, let's say friends and family that maybe, I don't know, your friends and family might also be economists, but let's assume that they don't have uh, an economics or crypto background. So two very different profiles. Um, how do you explain DeFi to them? So if, let's go the easy way first of people who don't, really don't understand anything. And what I usually say is that, <laughs> so if, let's say my mom, my mom doesn't, she doesn't do finance very well. She does everything else very well though. So I said, okay, mom, we're going to create, we're going to, we're going to put some money, some of your money in this, in this DeFi thing, just crypto thing. So actually, I'm going to do it for her in a couple of days because she's been asking me to, to do, to do it, like to look into alternative assets. So crypto is, is the thing. So she, so I'm going to open um, a MetaMask wallet for her and for her to keep some crypto. And basically, how I sell it to her is very simple. I said, mom, you know the financial market is really bad, right? And you've got some cash lying around. So why don't you put your cash into something else that can earn you a little bit more? And it's just, you know what, this cash, just experiment. Just figure out, how, figure, it, figure out how this works and just put a little bit of money in there and see what works and just be okay with the money going away. But I'll help you to figure out which, which one will be the less probability of it going away. And then the next question she asks is, okay, so how much money can I get per, year, per month? And I said, no, it's not like that. If I can tell you how much money you get a month, it's called a Ponzi scam. And that's not what it does. The returns is really variable based on the market. And if we don't know how much the S&P is going to give me every month, then we also don't know how much crypto is going to give me every month. And she said, okay, fine, I'll try it. So I, I love it. I love, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's about trying to keep it simple and like connect dots to something that someone um, already understands. Like you have to you have to draw um, a line between a concept that already makes sense to them. Um, tell me about then. How how do you explain it to folks who are a little more financially savvy? Could it could have worked in the finance industry, or okay. or maybe um, I'm curious if you have any friends too who have worked in academia uh, with yeah. with economics. Yeah, so those are a bit more difficult. So ah. I guess Wall Street will be easier because um, like a, a lot of I have a lot of. I have a good amount of Wall Street friends and I always ask them because um, just to get a different perspective because the crypto people are always very hype about crypto and DeFi and sometimes you need the Wall Street people to just balance your the positivity <laughs> because sometimes it's too much. So just trying to balance it out. And that's a bit more difficult because so I, always, I usually start with, you know, DeFi is really interesting because it reduces the, in, the intermediaries, it reduces the inefficiencies and we can start looking at distributed ownership of different things and it becomes, now assets can be accessible to everyone and anyone. Okay, so that's a good start. And then the, the next question is usually, yeah, but I can do that on, on any, I can do that digitally. I don't, I don't need crypto for that. I don't need blockchain for that. Everything else that blockchain can do, you can do it with centralized ledgers. So for example, a lot of these Swiss banks, 
they see the value in that and they're just implementing it in centralized ledgers because you want the whole transparency uh, transparency and like traceability plus you can look at new business new token models so that's actually quite cool or with the intermediaries it's not that much difference because at the end of the day as much as you want to think crypto is completely with without intermediaries that's the possibility mm -hmm. the reality is that intermediaries will still exist because for example if you're um a, an investment fund or your VC and you can't invest directly because your mandate doesn't allow that, then you still need intermediaries. So it's not that much different from traditional finance. But what I usually say is that there are now new new models and new new mechanisms and new ways of doing things, which is very interesting. So for example, AMMs are cool because AMMs, now you don't need us, you don't need market makers as a you know these big players coming in to to say that oh, I'm the market maker and now I, I'll be earning a bunch of money. Now we can distribute market makers and we have decentralized market makers. Everyone can be a market maker in their little forms. So that's really cool. Or trades can now be positive sum. Usually trade, I trade with you and you trade with me and that's it. But with AM, with Bancor's version two, where you have insurance for impermanent loss, then basically there is there is very low risk in becoming a market maker and yeah. then allowing trade to happen. So trade now becomes a positive sum game. And that is, that's something absolutely new. And that's something very interesting that we don't see in traditional finance. And at the end of the day, sure, it might not be a big leap from traditional finance because every leap is, every step is a small little gradual step. And right now we're experimenting with the low, the low hanging fruits, the exchange, the trading, the swaps, the lending and borrowing. Yeah. And then we start moving up the kind of fruits available in the, in the tree and look at something a bit, like looking at derivatives, looking at bigger ways to explore options of how DeFi can become a solution at reducing inefficiencies. We're still very, very new. So the idea is not really to say that traditional finance is completely useless and we should just move everything to DeFi tomorrow. DeFi is still in experimental phase. The thing is there's a huge potential in changing the way we understand DeFi or the way we understand finance and looking at new mechanisms to start aligning incentives between all these different people and all these different agents, which which is very powerful, I think. It's interesting to me that you find it easier to explain DeFi to, uh, let's say, like your mom versus uh, friends that work on Wall Street. I've actually had more of like the opposite uh, experience. And I mean, maybe, you're, maybe your mother is more open-minded and curious than my mother then, but my... Uh, Man, my friends and family, like they just, they tune out. Like you would think that me, with all the time I spend making like DeFi content, you'd be like, this guy probably has an easier time explaining uh, it to friends and family. I struggle as much as anyone. You know, they they shut off. In fact, a lot of my friends and family don't really understand even what I do or what I work on. Yep. But when I talk with someone with a finance background, and, mm -hmm. and I didn't work in the financial um, services industry, I, I don't even have a degree in economics, I have an easier time because it always starts with like, what do you work on? And if they mention, mm -hmm. oh, I trade options, I'm like, oh, cool. So there's like this thing called mm -hmm. Hedgic and, and there's this thing called Open and you know, I start to kind of expand on it. So anyway, mm -hmm. just found that super interesting. Can, can you expand on, um, do you ever dive further into like why decentralization is important? And like, do you, do you find anything that really hooks folks in terms of like having the light bulb go off and realize, Oh, this is what DeFi is about. Cause it's a huge mm -hmm. component of the, of the value that DeFi brings, but it's also, I want to say decentralization is kind of, it's an odd term. It's something mm -hmm. I remember when I first heard about it, joining like the Ethereum community and Bitcoin. I was like, what the hell does that even mean? Um, so anyways, do, do you find um, anything in particular that helps people to understand the importance of decentralization? Yeah, so I found something that works with, with the finance or economics folks. One thing that, so in economics, you have different kinds of goods, right? You have public goods, you have private goods. And one problem with public good is that you have this thing called tragedy of the commons. So you have air, you have water, and because I can, I can consume more and benefit more, and the, the cost usually goes to someone else, so I'll just keep consuming, everyone keeps consuming, and then the goods are, are just gone. So that's what we have in, in the physical world. And one, pro oh, I actually have a, 
a short little drawing over here. One of the problem, okay, so in economics, you have this, you have this thing, capital and labor. Mm -hmm. So these are two ways we can earn money. You either use your labor hours or use your hours to provide labor and you earn money, or you have capital that does that for you. So capital will be stuff like your machineries or land or, you know, like oil and stuff like that. So one thing that we see, and especially the, during these COVID times, you see a lot of reports saying that people earning money are those with capital already. So that means people with with the AI or people with the machine learning algos, people with, with physical machineries, people with resources and land, they're earning a lot and the expense is these people with labor. So all the people who are using labor to earn income becomes, they become expendable. And that's a, that's a very sad reality. And the thing is, if anything, COVID just shows us that this is going to get worse. So people with capital will accumulate more capital. People with labor, they need to find some way, otherwise they will die. And one thing that I see, I see decentralization, as, especially Web 3.0 with this open source things, with decentralization, is that now we're creating digital assets, digital capital, and we are de distributing this capital. So instead of going down the route with what we have today and having all this capital consolidated with people who already have capital and having inequality spread so much wider, we are creating decentralized capitals or we are creating digital capitals and de decentralize that. And that could be things like your algos, all the things that's on all the smart contract algos that we have on GitHub, all these different kind of code that you can just fork. These are very, very interesting things that it's that it's really cool that we can distribute this capital. And you know, Git Gitcoin is giving out a lot of different funding as well to help and create and contribute to this public goods. So this becomes a very important thing. When we distribute capital, when we move to a new world of digital economies, and the base layer is capital that everyone can have access to. Right now in physical world, you have limited capital. With land, there's only so much land. And it's not like one person can use the land and the other person can use it at the same time. No, land is land, it's fixed. There's only one use. But when we talk about algos, we talk about smart contract, we talk about the code, people can just copy paste the code. And now you, one, two people can use the same code with different tweaks, and that becomes so powerful. So in Web 3.0, it's about distributing this capital so that everyone can start on a level playing field. Sure, to get to that level playing field, there's a lot of social issues and whatever, but at least there is a base layer that people can have access to. And I think that's extremely powerful in the future that we want to build. If you want to use the technology to decentralize things, to make it a bit more fair for everyone to get started with, that's what, that would be very powerful. Lisa, give me just one second. I'm going to let my very loud cat in the room. Hold on. <clears throat> and there he is. That's funny. Have a cat and a dog. Both are very needy. OK, um, uh, kind of like going with what you were just saying, I'm curious, do, do you think that the surge in DeFi interest over the summer, um, or really like I guess the last year, but especially over the summer, is it just coincidental that it's coincided with these market cycles? Like it's coincided with uh, what? Do, what do I want to say? COVID and the fact that we're we've been in like a two to three year bear market, or is there more to that? Going back to the the economics principles that you tend to focus on, like what what has triggered this? You know this uh, huge interest that we've seen um, in in DeFi lately. I would say it comes in two folds. And the, the first one is the, the systems itself. We talked a lot just now about people who have been quietly building things for two years and trying to create all these really cool systems and products. So that's the, the almost like the internal economy of these systems being built. And the external economy is where, so one of the things that's very important to also note is behavior economics, how people behave. So Matt Levine, his, he is um, one of these writers at Bloomberg very very smart guy and he talked about this thing called in econ or in financial market you have the efficient market hypothesis right and so he talked about the bottom market hypothesis where in COVID times people are so bored casinos are closed the only thing that you can play is robin hood or your video games and robin hood is basically like video games with real money and and that itself is okay it's quite fun and whatever but now you have an, an alternative where you you have crypto products and you could play with that. 
And just in time that these different products that have been quietly building for a long time, they come into place and they tell everyone that, hey, these products are being built a lot more successful or a lot more robust now compared to before, or you know, really cool design and cool build. And then everything starts to fall like dominoes. So where one product starts to have very high APYs or because people have money, people have funds, you don't know where to put them. You just put them in something that gives you pretty good yield. And then you have all these different experiments coming into play. Yield farming and, I mean, yield farming started before with, um, with synthetics. So they already created yield farming. The hype was not that big, but now you could have a hype. You, you can have the hype, which is so much greater, greater returns because the, whole, the market is just really bad. I mean, if you look at the bond markets like a few months ago, the highest you could get was Chinese bonds, which is like 3%. And not, if, not everyone can get access to that. And then the US treasuries are doing very bad. All, like, don't, don't get started on the developing markets. They're doing very, very poorly. And then um, Australia having recession first time in 20 years. So everywhere in the world is just really sad. The only place you can get some fun is if you trade a lot of Tesla for some reason, and if you play video games, or you go to crypto. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know it's been, it's just been such a wild year. And I mean, it was a much scarier time, I think back in March, at least like a lot mm -hmm. of the world now, um, I can say at least speaking to the United States, uh, back in March, we just, you know, we saw surges with barely anyone wearing masks. And now it's really like a standard, of course, which um, when I look and talk with like friends that are in Singapore and China and Korea and um, Japan, like, you know, I feel like uh, wearing a mask even during flu season had always been common. But uh, now, like, I guess I'm less afraid of like a total collapse of the economy now or, or even of separately of the stock market. Um, and that was something I always worried about weighing down DeFi and crypto and uh, Ether and, and Bitcoin. But now it feels like it feels like the genie's out of the bottle. And there's a lot of people discovering like all of the value, you know, in our space. Um, Lisa, can, can you tell me more about uh, uh, we were talking before the call a bit about this. I want to make sure we cover all of these like uh, uh, bigger topics. What do you think is the public good of the future? And and is that related necessarily to, to DeFi with, I guess, with all the research you do in tokenomics? So in general, as I mentioned in Web 3.0, the public goods would be everything really in digital, in digital forms. So your different kind of codes for smart contracts, these yeah. kind of, I would say these, these bonding curves application in the different AMMs, they're basically the algorithms for these different bonding curve types. And these are all open source. These are all available on, code, available on GitHub, and people can just take them and then play around with them. So bonding curves started very simply in, for AMMs with just two different tokens, and you have just X and Y with mm -hmm. the same, and just X multiplied by Y, and then you get whatever. And that was the very standard, simple model. Bancor was a bit more complicated, but yeah. If you simplify it, it's the same thing as Uniswap. So that's very cool. And then people started taking it, playing around with it. Then you have balancer, you have curve, playing around and modifying the kind of tokens or the kind of structure that there's over there. Then you have Dodo doing um, PMMs, which is also a slight variation of all these different things. Mm -hmm. So I would say that all these standard, standard <clears throat> mechanisms moving forward will be one of these public goods that's available and open source for everyone to use. And then there's also you know data data sets available. So Ocean Ocean's marketplace has a lot of data, like I think AI data sets available or just data sets available. You have a lot of other mechanisms out there where you could have just information and data available where people can have access to. So there will also be another form of there'll be another form of public goods. So public goods are just you know goods and resources that people could use to help advance them in wherever they want to go. It's funny because what you're saying there too is is not foreign to me, and it seems so natural. But it's because oh. I, I'm living in a world of using permissionless DeFi applications all the time, and I recognize that. I, I just recognize, like how accessible those public goods are, mm -hmm. and so and yeah, I, I absolutely can see that. I remember back in 2017, I think it was, uh, I think it's the founder of Singularity.net or. Oh. 
anyways, he's he's the guy with the AI robot that everyone has seen on stage. And he was talking about basically having a, like a repository of all this AI data um, on the blockchain. And uh, three years ago, it it was like difficult for me to like wrap my head around. And now I'm like, yeah, of course that will happen. Like, of course, all the data will come together in one place and everyone will have access to it. And maybe there will be a token involved. But at the end of the day, a lot of these tokenomic systems will easily be able to power machine to machine, you know, interactions. So Ocean does that. Ocean has been doing that for, I, don't, I think, three three years already, where, yeah. they're, where wow. they just have data sets available. I don't know if it's already like clean data sets or there are raw data sets, but it's mm -hmm. for you to do to run some machine learning stuff on these data sets. And they do have like tokens in place and everything. So that's very interesting. You just also reminded me that the other kind of public goods available is education. And I can't believe I didn't think about that. <laughs> because yeah. the, the gap, I, when I, so when I, I came into this space because there's absolutely one, there's one-on-one level kind of information. And then mm -hmm. the next step, is to start reading papers. I, I read a lot of academic papers, yeah. but that was the only step. You either are one on one or you have really complicated papers. What about all the people in between? That's a lot of different people. Right. And so, yeah, education, absolutely. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I tend to not think about that either as much. Mm -hmm. And you're right. That's, well, I've definitely discussed it more recently because, like, we have really young kids and I'm very skeptical that they're going to go to a four-year university, even though both me and my wife did. And, and like, I think we're like really grateful for that education, mm -hmm. but I would tell anyone it was the most like in the most inefficient way to learn. It just, you know, and I, I normally hear friends defend it by saying, Oh, you know, uh, university college, whatever you call it is uh, it's about an experience. And I'm like, that is a hell of an expensive <laughs> experience to pay for. So yeah, I, I definitely would be excited to see what sort of like um, public goods we see in the, in the education mm -hmm. space in the future. Um, Lisa, I, I want to make sure we get you off on time. So I know we've got like maybe 15 minutes uh, mm -hmm. left. Do you want to screen share your table of contents for the, uh, the book uh, that you'll be publishing? And maybe we can sort of walk through some of the uh, more interesting parts of it. Um, that you'd like to highlight stuff that all of us can read in the book when we eventually buy a copy, but would love to kind of highlight some of the more interesting parts of it. Do you see it? Oh, uh, here we go. There we go. Awesome. Now we can see it. Okay. So you're, oh, you guys will be the first people who are looking at the content page. That's not my editor or the designer. Awesome. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And, and you know what? Uh, feel free to guide us through it, but I'll definitely have questions along the way um, as we Absolutely. talk through it. So I didn't have time to edit it, but basically between all these chapters, there are a lot of little lines. I deleted a few, but then the rest of, because, okay, it's a very, very long content page thing. So I wanted to make it a bit neater, wow. but I didn't have enough time. But so a to lot, give you you're covering a lot though, too. I mean, this isn't, yeah. you know, we're not learning the ABCs. We're learning everything in between so very cool so to give you an overview they're going to be there there are 26 chapters the first 13 chapters is on designing economics how finding out how to have how to use tokens or different kind of mechanisms as incentives to align these different interests of your distributed agents or distributed users so that's all the economics things and then the last the last 12 chapters is going to be on on DeFi on the math of DeFi and all that kind of stuff. And then the last chapter is to conclude. So I'll just run you through and then just stop me anytime. Absolutely. Because I can really go on forever. So I think there's something that's quite, I when I read a book, I usually read from cover to cover, but because this book is to be something like um, operations manual or like a, a little encyclopedia for you to understand where to get started. So I divided them into, you know, depending on who you are and way, how you should get started reading and what are the things, what are the chapters you should be reading. Then the introduction is really on economics first. So the introduction to economics of token engineering, then yeah. the evolution of economics, which I think is very important because the thing is economics is economics is an alive thing. Physics is different because physics and hard sciences is they're pretty much fixed and, and just there, right? But economics is a bit alive because you deal a lot with people's behaviors. So mm -hmm. there's a very important understanding to how economics has evolved because then it makes sense to understand why we're designing economics in the first place. So that's that. 
And then we look at coordination and incentives because there's so many distributed participants around. How do you align incentives of everyone? How do you coordinate everyone? So if you remember, I don't know if, if you guys took economics in school, just 101. Usually mm -hmm. they talk about supply, demand, yep. and equilibrium. Well, the reality is that as economics continues to evolve, supply and demand are, not, are no longer independent. They actually depend on each other. So supply and demand now becomes an in interdependent variable. Mm -hmm. And in equilibrium just does not exist. Because when we're looking at all these different systems and states, equilibrium is just a short period of time. And it shifts all the time. So how do we, almost like how do we create this self-governing ecosystem where equi equilibrium is, exists around a small subset of variables or small subset of values that we are comfortable with? Anyway. Can you give an example of how you've seen that play out in DeFi maybe over the, the past yeah. summer? So let's take Nexus because we talked about Nexus just now. So Nexus has two variables that are affecting the price of the token. And that will be the MCR and the market cap. So the the ratio, the reserve ratio, if you think about banks, you know, reserve ratio, that's the MCR. And then market cap is the total amount of money that they have. Mm -hmm. And these two variables are are two variables that one is talking about the short-term growth, one signals the short-term growth, one signals the long-term growth of the the ecosystem or the platform. And then transferring the market cap into the MCR is quite a, a very interesting task because you can increase the percentage every day of the MCR mm -hmm. so that you can play around with it. And the recent proposal by, by Yen Liberman um, with Delphi, they, they, will, they suggested to stop the increase in MCR because of a lot of other reasons, but there'd be too much to go into details. And that will affect the equilibrium that we're looking at because these two variables are fighting against each other. These two variables are signaling to other people so that they can make decisions whether to invest or not. And yeah. as a result, you have an equilibrium that kind of stays there, but it hovers around, um, it hovers around the the idea or the the point in general. Does yeah. that make some sense? It, it does. Yeah, yeah. That that's a really nice dynamic example because over the summer, uh, at one point, DeFi was growing so quickly. Mm -hmm. Nexus. Uh, they, they basically, if, if anyone's new to this, minimum capital required, it's it's the level that the mutual requires to ensure that it can confidently pay out all, all premiums or all cover um, if everyone redeemed their insurance at once. And they increased it originally 1% every day. They moved it up to 1% every four hours. Mm -hmm. Now, that normally could actually, it could drive the price down of NXM, but as a result, it actually incentivized more people to buy uh, NXM, which allowed the mutual to offer more insurance. And, mm -hmm. and so anyways, it, it's a very, if you go down the rabbit hole with this, which Lisa has a bunch of great episodes on um, mm -hmm. Nexus. Uh, if you go down the rabbit hole with this, it, it's almost the reverse of what you would expect. You're like, wait a sec. So we're gonna continue to make life harder on the mutual by increasing this minimum level of capital required, but as a result, more people were actually wanting a piece of the mutual to offer more insurance. So anyways, um, how about Lisa, can you call out here uh, shelling point? This is something that comes up a lot in crypto in general. Uh, do you mind just like defining it or maybe relating it to something that we've seen lately in DeFi? Mm -hmm. So I, I, before I went into yeah, all please. these very difficult detail things, then I wanted to start with something simple, like, you know, the seven seven things that people talk about in general when it comes to yeah. token economics. I should have added game theory in, but never mind. <laughs> so it's sure. just seven things that people talk about yeah. all the all the time. So yeah. shutting point is basically if I say, let's meet tomorrow in New York at a train station, where would you go? So, uh, say that again, if I were in the train station? what no, if, if I say tomorrow we'll meet in New York City, at mm -hmm. a train station. Which train station will you go? Oh yeah, wouldn't know. I guess I would go to the one closest to me. Which is? Oh, I'm not in New York, but if I if I did, uh, look, I, look. I I would go to one in Brooklyn. Okay. So usually when you ask people this question, they usually converge to one main point that they naturally tend towards. Can you make a guess? One of the oh, biggest uh, train stations. Union? Is it Union Station? Is that it? 
or it's sent, so, I, I'm not familiar. I, so I don't live, forgive me. I don't live in New York. What's the name of the big one? The, the most historic one. It's Penn station. Penn right? station. Is that it? Okay. There we go. Yeah. So that's the biggest train station. So, or if, if you give people a bunch of numbers, you know, mm -hmm. four of them are really jumbled up. One is just all zeros. Mm -hmm. What, what was, what's the number that, number that people naturally tend towards? Usually it's the, the one with a log zero. So, Schelling point is basically created by this economist called Thomas Schelling, and the other name for it is called focal point. And it's just a point that people naturally tend towards without any, any form of coordination. Like people just psych almost by common sense or by, by gut feeling that they will, they will tend towards that point. So that is, that's, what, that's the idea of Schelling point. Yep. So Schelling point is used in a lot, in a few areas. And one, okay, so the most important, like the easiest one will be voting. So sure, voting, for some things, voting can have a, have a right or wrong, right? But a lot of other things in life, voting is quite subjective. And yeah. how do we find a way where we can, how do we, how do we coordinate all these people towards an, a, something that we can agree upon without having too much, too much rules to coordinate all these activities? So that's where the idea of Shelling Point comes in. So this could be stuff like um, your prediction markets and you have wisdom of the crowd, that's related to shelling point. You have your different kind of voting mechanisms that can be related to shelling point, but also it depends on your incentive and mechanisms for voting and governance. So in, in general, shelling point is just the, the common point that people naturally tend towards. Majority of people naturally tend towards. And uh, can you remind me, uh, shelling point is often used in the Bitcoin community and, and maybe like, how does that relate back uh -huh. to Bitcoin? Okay. So when you have when you fork the bitcoin network you mm -hmm. have you have something that's like super long chain C can you see me i can yeah yeah here okay so you have this long water bottle that is the bitcoin network and then this small one which is a fork of the coin and so basically if you have if you have a new block to add which which one will you add to probably the the larger one yeah so that's because the larger one also signals that everyone has already voted for this. And in yeah. general, without thinking, without ways to coordinate, people will naturally tend towards the longer one or the, you know, yeah. the, the larger one. And so that's that's shelling point used in Bitcoin. So it's you don't have to govern too much about how people, you don't have to be too worried about a lot of a lot of forks of these, the, the Bitcoin network or the Bitcoin yeah. chain, because people will naturally tend towards the longest one. I think if anything, I've learned today that I am very excited to read your book just because <laughs> like there's a lot that I clearly like need to learn. Um, I think it's funny, like some of the examples, like it, you're like, what train station? And I'm like, I have no idea. I don't know how this concept works. Um, this is really cool. This is like, uh, so like I have a physical sciences background and um, yeah, like you hit it right on the head. Like Basically, like once something is established, uh, like, you know, you have like laws of physics, like these things are very concrete and they don't change over time. The thing about economics has just always been so interesting to me is there is a concept like that. I mean, there is a parallel to certain ideas are more concrete, but so much of it just continues to change over time. And I think that's really interesting. Like I, I uh, it, like. I mean, because it, it, at the end of the day, economics is so dependent on people's behavior and behavior and societies change so much over time. And so it, it's, it's definitely going to be like a fascinating book uh, to read. Um, Lisa, going back to the table of contents here, what else do you think is worth calling out uh, beyond the chapter five? So we're at chapter five. Yeah. And then, you know, and then after every chapter, so when I did the research, I, I turned the, my research into a framework for the economics part, and it divides into three pillars. So market design, mechanism design, and token design. And mm -hmm. so I just go deep into them, the different factors to think about. And then after after all of them, I usually add a case study so that you can see how it's being applied. Wow. So that's wait, that's a lot, but let's go to the, the DeFi things. Oh, then there's also one big chapter on bonding curves, how it's being used, the different properties, um, how, what are the things to change, what are the different ways to use them, other economic yeah. principles, which are also very important, but then there's so much. Like, you, you must have you been overwhelmed for the past six months with just there's so much happening that it's like, oh, that's another chapter. I guess I should add or should I? Like at some point, you just got to cut it off and publish. But 
I, I have yeah. a feeling you're going to have to republish quite a bit just because there's so much changing. And so this initially, this was just 12 chapters. And every every time I go back and edit it, it's one new chapter. So there are 26 chapters wow. now. So I edited it quite a bit. Very cool. Very but let's cool. go to the DeFi things because I think the DeFi part yeah. is very interesting. Um, so there's the introduction to, to DeFi, how the understanding of different sectors, how it's being used, comparing it to traditional finance, talking a little bit about Ponzi-nomics, and then some math stuff, and the math of all the different things, uh, crypto insurance, like fundraising and bonding curves. And I think, so the, the last, K3, oh, two things that's interesting. So the first one is crypto derivatives, and crypto derivatives and financial risks, these are quite relatively new. I mean, they exist in traditional finance. And I think that's something to where people can get a bit, like people in traditional finance or investors get a bit more excited to understand what are the different options there available and what are the different risks. Because in crypto Twitter or in crypto in general, everyone is talking about a lot of hypes, a lot of hypes. The risks, I mean, you talk a lot about the risk in all your videos and I love that. And people need to talk a little bit more about the risk because as we, talk, as we talk about going mainstream, we talk about open finance and everyone getting access to finance. Finance is risky business. It's not, and that's why nobody, not everyone's in finance because it's very difficult sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And it's very important to let that, let the risk be known and then mm -hmm. figure out how to, how to hedge that risk. And that's usually done with derivatives or insurance that you want to talk about. And one thing that I'm, I've not put it inside because I've not figured it out yet, but I've been talk, thinking about it for a year now is crypto as, as a new asset class. So we have you know, your traditional asset classes, your equity, your, your, your fixed income, your FX, all that kind of, your property, your, yeah, property. Crypto as an asset class would be a very interesting thing to think about. And that will really help with regulations or regulators understanding how to regulate space. And then we can look more into securitizing crypto tokenization or securitizing tokens. And that would be extremely fun. But one thing that I want to talk about Okay, so, oh, that's so long. It's tokenizing this book. So one experiment uh, I have, cool. one, so I think to, you should only have tokens if the tokens make sense and the tokens actually add value. If the tokens mm -hmm. don't add value, if the tokens just exist because they're tokens, that's, that's bullshit, you should not have tokens. So one experiment that I'm having, I'm playing around is NFTs. And so NFTs plus DeFi is amazing. I love that. And right now, a lot of NFTs are in video games, very good are in uh, yeah, mainly just video games and digital art or um, artists and personal yeah, two I tend to think of too yeah there's there's a lot more that seems possible but it's just because it's so easy to understand like you're playing a game and you you own something in the game or you uh, uh, with art it's just art is just so much fun because it's at the end of the day it's like it's very visual. And we all like think about like a piece of art that hangs on the wall is whether it's a copy or not, it doesn't matter. It is like, it's, it's a unique singular thing that you own, mm -hmm. but in the digital realm, like that's, that's what NFTs tend to, uh, uh, to replicate. Mm. And I, I think that in its own right, it's very fun. And you know, yeah. a lot of people are exploring that. I love it. I think one of the ways where NFTs can really add value to what we have tr in the off chain world is the different kind of rights that it could enable. So it could be intellectual property rights, it could be publishing rights, it could be copyrights. Mm -hmm. So one thing I've been exploring is how do I how do I tokenize these kind of rights that's available in in the real world? Mm -hmm. And then I thought about publishing rights. So this book will be the publishing rights of the book is an NFT. And only you know only publishers can have access to that. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea is to tokenize this book as an NFT for the public, tokenize the publishing right of this book as an NFT. And then of course there's bonding curves involved. And so there's, there's going to be stuff relating to the bonding curve and then token issuance and distribution only to, to be an account for royalties and income distribution to all these different publishers. That's really cool. Yeah, I, I always love anytime you can dog food, like what's in DeFi. Um, mm -hmm. This is, yeah, that, that'll that be really interesting. By the way, Lisa, do you know uh, yet when this will publish, or do you think it'll be before the end of 2020 or um, oh, later? When when will the book be published? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it'll be published on the 13th of December. Oh, um, excellent. Okay, cool. 
I'm trying to get it a bit earlier, so a couple of days earlier. So I should see how how that goes. Absolutely. Hard on that. Um, I guess anything else here with the book that you want to call out, Lisa? I think we we've mostly combed through all of the the different chapters here, but mm -hmm. uh, like actually, more generally speaking, uh, which you might have already called this out in the book, is what do you think are some of the most important innovations in DeFi? Like, uh, if you had to name like I don't know three, what what do you think is the are the lasting innovations that we'll see over the coming years? So the the first one is definitely bonding curves. Bonding curves as a mechanism, and then can be used in fundraising. Can use be it can be used in AMMs, whatever. But bonding curves number one. I would say the the second one is the integration on, of NFTs and DeFi, because right now we're still looking at video games as an NFT or art as an NFT, but the NFT and DeFi can be an ex, like a really explosive field to look at or a very, very big industry. And that's, that's very exciting. And the third one would be, oh, the third one is algorithmically, that algorithmically determined stable coins. That is very exciting because I think right now we're looking at stable coins just because they are, they're, they're linked or soft packed to USD or one one of these major currencies. They're easy. Yeah, yeah. They're just easy for people to understand. Yeah. I'm curious, what is an algorithm, algorithmically uh, powered stable coin? Or what is there an example of one? Ampleforth. Oh, Ampleforth. Oh, yeah. okay. I, I never had called it that, but okay. How yeah. How do you call it? Um, you know, I just called it a really interesting project that's trying to do a stable coin. So, yeah, it's, could you uh, could you expand on that a moment? Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't fully understand what Ampleforth is trying to do. I guess also, like, I don't know if you um, study Empty Set Dollar. I thought that's another really interesting one. It kind of builds on Ampleforth. But yeah, well, how does the Ampleforth mechanism work? And like, what? how does that enable them to create a stable coin? Hopefully a stable coin. In general, the reason why we the reason why there's a value add to have a token that is not backed by government because these soft on-chain and off-chain collaterals they still are tied to to uh yeah maybe yes or no but it, they're still tied very much to governments right but this algorithmically balanced or al algorithmically powered stable coins mm -hmm. is where you have this stable coin that is determined by code or determined by by secondary market, depending on how you do it, there are a few ways to do it. Basically, the, the biggest plus point is that now you can have a token that's completely unrelated to governments. And that's powerful because without, without governments, these tokens can still have value because of the algorithms and mm -hmm. the, the trading activities that's done. And the thing is, one of the biggest problems that, is that oh, in economics, money is not neutral. Mm -hmm. Money is really subjected because they're tied to government, tied to trust of government. And so, and government is, you know, sometimes they, unless you're a dictator, you always have to think of elections. Because it's tied to elections, because it's tied to personal interest, then money could have a bias towards some kind of outcomes that they want. And so now money doesn't, money now is not a neutral tool that helps to allow people like you and me to make a living or yeah. Th that works for us. It works for these electors who have control over money, which is, I mean, it's not a, it's not a bad thing if these people know what they're doing, but if they're very short-term focused, whereas the economy is long-term focused, that's right. a problem. Yeah. So one, so in general, how this works is it, there's graph, there are graphs, there's math involved, but the general idea is, how do I explain this very simply? Um, there, oh, okay. So Ample Force one is a bit easier. With Ampleforth, is that the the tokens or each each amp each amp, amp token AMPL each token will be equal soft pack to one dollar, and they have a band of like five plus minus five percent of which it will fluctuate, and and they wouldn't rebalance, and then every every day it will rebalance to make sure that it's within that that um, boundaries that they they have that they approve of approving of, and so if your value of your token goes too high. Mm -hmm. So if it's if it's meant to be one dollar, but it became two dollars suddenly, so what it would do is it will increase tokens in your in your wallet, so that yeah. you will have instead of one token 
worth two dollars, you have two tokens worth one dollar each. So at the end of the day, instead the the difference with this is that instead of counting how many coins you have, it's these the things that's constant is your ownership or your yeah your your share ownership of the entire market cap. So if let's say I own ten percent of it of the market cap, then no matter how many coins that's burnt or minted because of the fluctuation in value, I will always own 10% of the market cap. But it's very difficult for someone, you know, a random person to come in and say that, why do I suddenly have more tokens today and tomorrow I have half of what I used to have? And that's because market fluctuates, but the value that you own, the, the ownership of the market cap is actually still the same. So this is one of the, the difficult things. And this is also one of the risks available because you it's almost like a liquidity issue where yeah. you, you have 10 tokens today and tomorrow you just have eight. Like, where did the two tokens go? They just burnt. But your valuation, or the valuation you have as, as the tokens power is actually the same. So what, I think this is quite powerful and interesting. Lisa, how do you, what do you think of how that experiment's playing out? Because like, I've been fascinated by it too. Uh, I, by the way, I don't have any exposure to it. So I, I have mm-hmm. feel uh, uh, nothing in terms of expressing that interest. Uh, mm-hmm. But when I've, followed Ample Forth, uh, especially over the summertime, they, they got a lot of attention. Um, to simplify it, you know, if, if it goes above a dollar, the rebase, uh, if it's, I think, a, over a dollar oh five, is that what yeah. it is? A uh, um, over a dollar oh five, the supply uh, expands and, mm-hmm. and in an effort to bring it back to a dollar. If it's below it, it actually shrinks. And, and you mm-hmm. know, all of us saw that once it got below a dollar, um, uh, multiple times it recovered, but mm-hmm. there was definitely, I don't know if you would call it like a death spiral or, but what happened was people were uh, clearly panic selling or some people, maybe they had lots of profits and they were just ready to take profits on holding ample. So just curious, like, um, do you know of any updates with the project or anything that you followed lately that they've done to, um, uh, to, to, ensure that the mechanism does what it's supposed to do, which is bring Ample back to $1. So the last time I checked, I, the last time I checked was a couple of weeks ago. So I, there isn't much updates, but from, from what I know, the cool thing about this mechanism is mm-hmm. that you could, so I talked about how money is not neutral, right? And in this right. way, you can't have money that's neutral because you're baking in monetary policy into the token. So in the token design itself, you have all these big in codes of monetary policy and you can't have any voters or governance or whatever to determine or change that unless you know everyone agrees or something. But with Ample Forth, you can't really do that. Everything is defined by code. So when you want to decrease the, you know, the whole burning tokens thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With minting, with minting tokens, it's very easy because everyone likes more tokens in their wallets. So it would just be minted instantly. But right. with decreasing the amount of tokens, with burning them. It doesn't happen instantly because there's this like behavioral thing with people, they get panic, they panic sell, as you mentioned. Right. So it's done over a period of 10 days, if I'm not wrong. So instead of it will check every single day and they will it will check how much to be burning if it's if it's of if it's undervalued. And that is what has caused some people to really freak out because at one point it shot up really high to four dollars. So that means the yeah. next day people have a lot of tokens. And suddenly it went back down and people's tokens were being burnt. So one of the biggest problems that I, I can imagine them is, or two, two of them actually, the first one is people, don't, people really don't understand the system. So I had this long video explaining how Empathoth works, you know, drawing graphs and everything. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. A lot of people stood, couldn't understand why the tokens would suddenly disappear. And mm-hmm. because they couldn't understand, they just mark it off as a scam. And okay, so also I also don't hold any Ampleforth. I think the mechanism is very interesting. So I wanted to go and dive into a bit more details about them. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you, you definitely like piqued my interest again in it. I, I haven't uh um I haven't looked at it in a while, but I, I think the latest thing I had seen was that so they used to do the rebase daily and you mm-hmm. would see at seven o'clock, like like clockwork, you'd see like mm-hmm. sell off sometimes right before it, sometimes right after it. Which was always interesting to me because it was like, it 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 was like, I mean, there's people that are taking a lot of risk, trying mm-hmm. to sell off and like buy back in, um, but then they changed it. I believe it's like at a random time now. Like it doesn't just oh. happen at the same time every day. 
Um, I might be wrong. I actually, I'll, I'll stop myself there. I, I really don't know enough there, but uh, al algorithmically determined stable coins. That's a really, yeah, we, gosh, we should definitely have you back in the future to talk more about this. I, I haven't thought about it as much. Empty set dollar though. Check that one out. Okay. As well. It's um, it really fascinated me because it seemed to play off of a lot of what was working with Ampleforth, but um, <laughs> actually it's even more, I find it to be even more complicated, mm -hmm. but I do believe like, as I've learned more about it, um, I've, I've been like, okay, like this seems to make more sense. Like there isn't a rebase when it's below a dollar, the empty mm -hmm. set dollar, uh, it, it, it doesn't require for, it doesn't require that you lose some of your tokens, but you can mm -hmm. choose to buy these coupons and then you can redeem them when it goes back above a dollar. But I don't know how difficult it is to redeem them. Mm -hmm. So anyways, it's it's a very interesting system. Uh, I think to, I heard about it recently. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll definitely look into it. That's very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, Lisa, I have one more question for you because we've kept you over time. Uh, who do you uh, draw inspiration from with all that you work on in this space? Like what's, uh, I, I guess, who are the, the folks that you admire most? Um, it could be in our community, in Ethereum, mm -hmm. DeFi, crypto in general, or um, maybe folks um, outside of the community. I look at a lot of date folks. So they're all the date economists <laughs> and I read the books and read the papers. And the cool thing is that their ideas are so innovative, but in the late, not 1800s in the 1900s it was not exactly the best time to execute them so mm -hmm. today we have the right tools we have the right technology we have the right capital involved and we could turn that into reality so that's that's very interesting number one and number two it's wow. it's people in hard sciences so like physicists like biologists people who are looking at genealogy people are looking at complex theory in the natural world and just looking at those concepts, how things are being applied in the natural world, and then taking those concepts and then applying them in the, the DeFi world. Because at the end of the day, these are still all complex systems. How do we, how does nature coordinate naturally? And how can we emulate that kind of coordination? And then using tokens to incentivize people's different behaviors. That's so interesting. I, I can't say, I don't dive as deep, I think, as you do. And, into um, reading about uh, the sciences now, but I will say like from the start, from my start in crypto, I always recognize the parallel of there are all of these really intricate systems. There's all this new language. And at the end of the day, what I learned in chemistry was that you have to really dumb it down for yeah. people. Otherwise, they they're very dismissive you know there are types uh and those are the types that probably become lifetime chemists who dig into it and like want to learn more but I, I think a lot of people there's a lot of people that are uncomfortable not understanding uh something and and like we have to work really hard to make it understandable and i think that's one of like the gifts that you have like you just are uh I, i've really i just wanted to say i really admire all the content you continue to create um, we would love to have you back on the show. Like you just, you cover so much here in this space. And I, I, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, as I was like combing through your podcast, I'm like, wow, like there's like so much here that we could talk about. We're going to completely run out of time, but, um, but anyways, uh, just want to remind everyone, uh, you should, uh, follow Lisa's, uh, uh, tokenomics design crypto firm at econs design on Twitter. Uh, you can also pre-order her book uh, at book.economicsdesign.com slash home. Also economicsdesign.com is a, is a website with so much to learn from there. So you should just check that out. She has an online course there. Uh, Lisa, anything else you'd like to leave folks with? Uh, well, oh, two things. Number one, Economics Design is hiring. So if you're interested, you can just reach out. Cool. And number two, I'm I'm looking at also doing, so I've, I've been doing like research research, like academic research. Mm -hmm. And one of them is looking at understanding a little bit more, uh, modeling the behaviors of how incentive mechanisms, you know, all these economic stuff affect people's behaviors in lending protocols, in different exchanges, how people behave. Yeah. So if there are any, if there are any, protocols that have data sets and want to be involved with the research, please let me know because data are very good and very useful to creating all these different models. So cool. Yeah. Uh, especially, uh, I'd encourage those who are 
creating new projects, uh, you know, there's there's probably something to to learn from, or maybe even like consult with you early on versus <laughs> versus launching a protocol without having consulted with uh, uh, a brilliant economist. So, uh, anyways, well, I want to remind everyone. Uh, funny enough, today we're going to do a second episode later with a bunch of ETH Global. Uh, winners. Uh, so this was a hackathon and there's a bunch of them related to DeFi. So we'll do that in about an hour and a half. And um, otherwise you can watch this full episode at tv.zapper.fi. Please uh, subscribe by either subscribing on YouTube or you can follow Yield TV on Twitter. And uh, and then in the show notes, we'll be sure to link uh, where you can pre-order Lisa's book and just all the links to all of the cool content she creates. So um, Lisa, thanks so much again for joining us. Um, we'd love to have you back. Um, I'm gonna play like the outro video, but if you have any questions, I'll, I'll still be on here afterwards. And um, everyone, I guess we'll see you, I'll see you in an hour and a half. So have a great day.